All right, welcome everybody to our session, Building an Inclusive Classroom. I am Carrie Cormier. I am a faculty member at Rowan University's College of Education's Department of Interdisciplinary and Inclusive Education. And I'm Jahari Sykes Ratliff. And I also am a faculty member in the College of Education Interdisciplinary and Inclusive Education. I work specifically in the early childhood program. We are so happy that you're joining us today. Um, and again, like Carrie said, we're gonna be talking about how to build an inclusive classroom. And for those of you that already feel as though you're on that trajectory, we're hopeful that you'll be able to take some information from this um, workshop or session in order to help um, you as you continue to build that inclusive classroom. So this um, visual is one that I love. And what it shows us is that there is a teacher sitting at the head of the table and there are children that are essentially different shapes and the table has the shapes there. So for myself, the way that I view this, if we were live right now to ask you what you think about this and what it means, but for myself, um, this shows that there are children that have different needs and in order to be responsive to their needs to, um, in order to really give them the information that they need um, to meet their learning profiles, we need to be making sure that we are modifying our instruction and strategies um, in efforts to really make sure that this environment and the space is supportive for them. So an inclusive learning environment is a space where children feel like their contributions and their perspectives are valued and that they're respected. So there's like main things that we need to be considerate of. And one is the classroom climate, uh, making sure that you're influencing in a way where it's enhancing the student's learning. Another is connecting with your students. There's the, the most important thing I think that you can do in the beginning of the school year and at any point throughout the year is relationship building and then connecting back to that relationship. Um, establishing ground rules, making sure that all of your children understand and practice this respectful and productive classroom um, communication, which then connects right back to the classroom climate. Then your teaching strategies really need to be inclusive. You want to consider the range of backgrounds that your children represent in the classroom, their characteristics, the expectations, all of these things factor into creating this productive learning experience that you want children to engage in. And then lastly, another important aspect of building this inclusive classroom um, is universal learning design. It eliminates unnecessary hurdles in the learning process. Um, and it helps improve the learning experience for all children. So this is when we're having a flexible learning environment and you are presenting information in a variety of ways so that your L's get it, your, and I'm saying L's because I'm looking at the picture, your mm -hmm. triangles, your circles, your squares, this multimodal approach is what um, you have to engage in to make sure that your children are provided options when they're being asked to demonstrate their learning. I think one of the things that I love about this picture, right, is when we're talking about building an inclusive classroom, it's also important to make sure that all the students feel accepted and also feel like they belong, right? And it's very clear from this visual that all students belong at this table. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that acceptance and belonging are two key ideas to help you take this work forward. Definitely. So what do you know about inclusive practice? This is what is it that um, you do you yourself right now to support these inclusive practices? So we're going to take um, maybe five or so minutes if you want to pause the video and you want to think for yourself what it is that you know and what you currently do. So one example is that you would say, I know for sure that it's important to create visual learning routines. So what I do is provide opportunities for children to work together in completing think pair share activities. And so in doing that, I post statements like, I think, and I wonder in order to encourage your curiosity, encourage them to think before they share their ideas out. So if you want to pause right now, just to, again, consider what you do and what you know about inclusive practices. All right, so our session focus in this session, we will explore both big and small practices that can be built into classroom and school spaces that foster greater inclusive culture in schools. So getting on the same page, it really helps us if we're all working from the same definition of inclusion to help us move forward. 
So I want you to think about these three various definitions of inclusion and which one you connect with the most. So inclusion is A, only related to ability in special education. Inclusion is B, only related to changing curriculum based on culture, gender, et cetera. Or inclusion is C, a means to overcome barriers related to multiple identity factors, for example, race, gender, ability, culture, ethnicity, or sexuality. So for us, we really identify with the last definition. And we take a broad approach to inclusion. So inclusion is overcoming any barrier related to multiple identity factors and understanding that our identities cannot be singled out into a single aspect, that they are um, so complex and interwoven, right? And we really think about this idea of intersectionality um, and that you can have multiple intersections and multiple ways in which your various identity points interact with each other, right? So inclusion is very much taking this broad approach so that everyone, no matter their background, can feel included and again, can feel like they belong and feel like they are accepted. And so with that, <clears throat> practicing inclusivity involves having an inclusive mindset. And so you might be asking, well, what is an inclusive mindset? So these are some of the definitions that we have come to um, used to understand what an inclusive mindset involves. So it involves acknowledging and resisting the social construction of students' identities. So we recognize that identity is a social construct. And so school is a place where these identities can be constructed. And so we are mindful of that. It also involves embracing diverse ways of being, doing, knowing, and thinking. So recognizing that all of our students are coming from various different backgrounds and that they're going to do things differently than us. And different is not bad, different is okay. And it's something that we embrace. And finally, an inclusive mindset involves adopting creative, collaborative and resourceful approaches to problem solving. So students diversities are honored in the learning process. And so not seeing again, these differences as deficits, but rather taking that creative and collaborative approach to problem solving, right? So identifying that a student may be experiencing something and I'm going to take a creative approach to figure out how I can help them be successful. And we also have a graphic on the slide, the stress response in students. So we have the fight, flight or freeze response. And we felt that this was floating around social media. We felt that it was helpful here because it really gives us a sense of where students are at um, and so many of these behaviors we might see in our classroom, and it really helps us to take a pause and see like, okay, where is the student coming from? What are they exhibiting? And is it a stress response, right? No student, you know, they may not looking under the flight column, they may not want to be unfocused, but that might be a stress response to something that is going on. So then again, having that inclusive mindset, taking that collaborative, creative approach to say, I have a student who's unfocused. Is it a stress response? If it is, what can I do to alleviate this? How can I help them be engaged? And so it's really having that um, moment of pause, right? That is very difficult in teaching, but that we need to strive towards to make sure that we are honoring all of our students. So when we look at how we can support this inclusive classroom that we're building, it's important to be aware of microaggressions. Um, so we wanna talk a little bit about this. Microaggressions, I wanna be very clear, does not mean that these acts can't have long lasting, big life-changing impacts. Micro means small, but th these are big things that impact lives. So microaggressions are defined as the everyday, subtle, intentional, and oftentimes unintentional interactions or behaviors that communicate some sort of bias towards historically marginalized groups. So there are two different types of microaggressions. One is micro insults. And this is when we make a comment or an action um, has occurred that's unintentionally discriminatory. And the other is micro invalidations. And this is when your comments invalidates or undermines the experiences of a certain group of people. So microaggressions in general um, can be experienced in a number of ways. And a lot of the times it's based on the family structure, social class, race, sexuality, gender, ability, um, disability, religion, appearance, or size of a person. 
Um, but the difference between a microaggression and overt discrimination or macroaggression is that people who typically commit microaggressions might not even be aware of them. So you can see here on the slide um, at the bottom, you speak excellent English. Where are you from? All lives matter. Everyone can succeed if you work hard enough. Oh, you're so articulate. These are all microaggressions. And while there may be good intention behind them, um, it is, it's, it's really um, a subtle interaction that is communicating a bias. So you don't have to be a part of a certain group to understand that something is unjust. It really is just about learning how to be empathetic to people. Um, and just to be aware and um, aware and knowledgeable of the person's history and what context it is that they come from. So when you are in your classroom um, and you witness a student that says something that essentially is a microaggression, how do you respond? Or do you not respond? Sometimes it's easier to act like you don't hear it. But in building this inclusive classroom where we're respectful and honoring and celebrating our differences and where each of us come from, you have to respond. And so how do you respond? And that's something um, just for you to think about and reflect on and hopefully encourages you to be more aware when you hear um, a microaggression that you can label it as such and then you can address it in an appropriate way where you're honoring the person that the microaggression was committed against and helping the one that said the microaggression or acted in that way to be aware of the um the, the pain that, that's associated with it. And so thinking here, right, about microaggressions, micro insults, um, thinking about how we communicate about students um, really has an impact and it matters, right? How we describe students matters, it matters very deeply. Um, our descriptions can inadvertently impact our actions, and it can also impact the actions of other students against their peers. Um, because students, no matter how young, they pick up on how students, how their peers are perceived in the classroom, how they themselves are perceived. Um, and so it's really important to be mindful of our language. And again, another great graphic here that has been floating around um, social media is, you know, this idea of problem focused versus solution focused. So calling a student bossy, um, and that is, you know, a, a lot of bias behind that and who gets called bossy and who gets told that they are a natural leader. So making sure that we're saying this to all students, you know, you're not bossy, you are a natural leader. You're not defiant, you hold a strong belief. Um, demanding, are you demanding or do you just know what you want? If they're dramatic, they can be expressive or passionate, right? Fearful, they can be very cautious or careful. Um, fussy, they have strong preferences. Hyperactive, they're energetic, enthusiastic, on the go. Um, and really making sure that we are framing students from that strengths-based approach. Um, and students, like we said, they pick up on it. Um, you know, just sharing an example, my son is in kindergarten um, and inviting students, inviting his classmates to his birthday party. One of the boys RSVP, his mother RSVP'd, and I said, oh, so-and-so is coming. He's like, oh, he's a troublemaker. In kindergarten, he was able to articulate that his classmate was a troublemaker. And so I said, why? Well, the teacher is always calling on him all the time and he keeps getting in trouble. And so it made me pause and wonder, is this teacher having a problem-focused approach or a strengths-focused approach? And so again, making sure that even as early as kindergarten, students are picking up on it. And so we're mindful of our language and we are mindful that we are working towards and striving towards taking a strengths-based approach. And that's not gonna happen all the time, we are human right? But it's something that we should keep present and focused in the front of our minds that we are working towards it. Um, and so if you do have to call out a student on something, making sure that you're doing it in perhaps a compliment sandwich, right? Where you say a positive and say, hey, I would really like you to stop doing this, but I love how you're doing this, right? So students are hearing a positive message a tied to an area of critique. Um, so again, just being mindful of the language that we use and its impact on students. Yeah, I think one thing before we start the video, I want to kind of just to <clears throat> back to what you're saying, Carrie. Thanks for sharing that um, 
your example with your son to combat a microaggression and to move away from those problem based language, um, the problem based language that we use, you want to rely on micro affirmations. That's the total opposite, and that's strength based. So these micro affirmations are small acts, and those acts in themselves foster inclusivity and support for children and any adults, parents, your colleagues, your students, parents, and family members. Um, anyone that's feeling isolated or invisible in the environment. So when you're rewarding positive behavior, if your lesson plans are culturally inclusive, if you're using positive words, those strength-based words that Carrie was just sharing, even um, when correcting a student's behavior or their work, these are all micro affirmations. So when you're consistently affirming what students are doing, consistently affirming um, any individuals really that you come into contact with, um, you see a shift in the environment. Um, and so people first language is something that we really felt was important to include in this conversation because we find that sometimes people emphasize a disability before the person. But the fact is that the person is who they are first. Their identity is more important than the disability. And so you want to make sure that um, you have identity first language, and that's when you're you're putting um, the the person before the disability. So if you're ever in doubt, um, you can always ask the person how you you like for how they like to be referred to. But if you have a student that's autistic, the student is not the autistic child; they're the child with autism. And so the video is going to go into um, more of what people first language is. It's person first language. Person first language puts the person ahead of any disability identifier, meaning a person who has autism or a person with an intellectual disability. Why is this important? A person with a disability is a person first. People with disabilities do not want to be seen first and foremost by their disability. It devalues their inherent uniqueness in personhood. Additionally, a person who uses an assistive device is not bound by it. A person who uses a wheelchair, for example, is much freer to move around this world because of their chair. This stems from the social model of disability. A person is disabled by lack of access to their community and environment not their impairment. Another common model is the medical model, which typically sees the person from a diagnostic point of view. Another common model is the charity model. This posits interventions or policies are done in the best interests of the person with a disability without including them or their experiences in the decision-making process. Also, using terms such as special, mentally retarded, handicapped, are disrespectful and possibly hurtful. Always ask the person how they choose to identify, but default to person-first language if you don't know. So this was just a, really a reminder for you, or if it's new information for you, um, hopefully is you know something that you'll be able to incorporate into your language before you you may um, label a person or you know no harm at all meant but you want to be very clear about how you're referring to the person if you are having to connect their disability to whatever it is that you're saying and so we want to take some time now to put things into practice um, so for each of these situations considered here we want you to think about how the scenario might be a barrier to inclusive culture. How does the scenario impact the students? How can we improve the practice? What could we do differently? So if you wanna take a moment and pause the video here, read through these five different examples, and then we will come back and discuss. All right, so let's start diving into some of these very common moments of practice that we've seen in classrooms. So the first one, you start your class with good morning, boys and girls. And so it's very common, right? It happens all over the place. But thinking about what might be problematic about this? Well, it brings gender into the situation. 
you know, and do we have to bring in gender? Do we have to remind students that you are boys and you are girls, right? Not necessarily, right? We can instead bring in good morning young scholars or good morning, you know, my wise little geniuses or something like that, right? Bringing in something academic could make it a little bit more inclusive and in that you're not necessarily putting gender into the situation. Um, so thinking about how you're framing your students from the very first thing that you say to them. Um, so again, good morning, young scholars is a great easy way to bring it in. You could bring in the school mascot, perhaps. Um, a lot of different ways you could address students beyond bringing up gender. Mm -hmm. um, so the second one, in March, you see students still referring to an anchor chart on the wall and announce to the class, oh no, I see some of us still haven't learned to do blank. And so again, like, you know, we want students to begin to internalize ideas. We want them to have things memorized and things like that. But if a student hasn't gotten to that point yet, now they are internalizing that like, oh no, I'm falling behind. I should be here and I'm not there yet. When mm -hmm. the whole purpose of an anchor chart right, is that it is a reference. We have it there for a reason. And if students are using it, that's actually a good thing. And going back to Jahari's idea of universal design for learning, visuals are a means of universally designing. Um, so instead, what you could do is maybe perhaps noticing the individuals who are still using the anchor chart, taking note of that, and talking to them and saying, hey, would you maybe like this in a smaller size in your notebook? you know, why are you still using the anchor chart? Do you still feel like not as strong in that skill? Um, and digging a little bit deeper into why they're using the anchor chart. And it gives you some insight again into, um, again, our opening visual, what shape they might be, right? What do they need? Um, and not diminishing students um, for their need to use a reference chart. And so the next one is you decide to have a whole class read aloud and use popcorn reading or popsicle sticks to figure out who will read next. There was actually a video recently on social media and um, they were doing the popcorn reading and it got to one of the guys and he was they're reenacting their childhood. And he was like, ah, uh, and he, he couldn't, he, he had difficulty reading, number one. Number two, now you're calling on me. So I'm super under pressure and it's almost like anxiety producing. So he just like panicked and had a meltdown. And so the video was funny. Like, you know, the intent was that it was funny, but it's really true, right? So if you have this high pressure environment where you're challenging me to read on the, in the spot, on the moment, and I know this is a word I struggle with and all of my peers' eyes are on me, you're highlighting this area that I, I may need some work in. And so it, it may be um, kind of diminishing and disheartening for children, dis, for a child, dis, discouraging um, for a child that has difficulty reading or a challenge with being put on the spot. I may be a proficient reader, but when all eyes are on me, it, it just, it does, it's just not going to happen. Um, so you want to consider some other ways um, that you can engage children in opportunities to show you their reading skills, if that's the purpose of this activity, or if you want to have an, a whole class activity, maybe popcorn reading is not the most beneficial thing to be doing because it does not truly support all learners. Um, the next one is you tell a class that they have a task and it must be completed in X amount of minutes. So this is also another um, situational that can be anxiety producing. Um, I'm on the spot. I have to work, get this done within X amount of minutes. I'm sweating. I'm looking at my watch or looking at the time or, oh my gosh, am I going to get it done? It totally trips you up. Um, it's, it's, it's really an unreasonable um, ask for a child. It really is. So we just have to consider, um, and I know sometimes we're under a time crunch. You have 20 minutes done and you have to get this portion of this test in, or you have to get this portion of this done. But if um, we can look at how we can kind of, you know, alter our schedules to really meet the needs of the children, because that's, the purpose of what we do is for the kids to really make sure that we are building this classroom space that is supporting their learning and helping them to be able to demonstrate their best. I'm not going to show you my best 
if I have two minutes to get something done, um, it, it's, it's, it, it likely will not happen. And this is not for all children, but even if it's one, that's one kid that that is not being supported the way that they need to. So thinking back to earlier, again, we had those fight, flight, or freeze responses. And in situations like this is often where you're going to see those come out, right? And a student's not going to tell you, oh, this is giving me anxiety, right? Again, like I don't expect my kindergartner to say, mommy, I have anxiety, right? But at the same time, they might be unfocused. They might Mm -hmm. be unsettled. um, And so you're going to see those stress responses in students. And so instead, because again, like Jahari said, Time is a very real thing that we do have to contend with in classrooms. You only have a certain amount of time to get a task accomplished. Mm -hmm. And so instead, how you might word this is tell your class, okay, we have 20 minutes to work. In 20 minutes, let's just see how far you've gotten. Mm -hmm. And so again, you're giving like those spot checks to students and taking a bit of the pressure off so that they do know that there is a time associated with this task, but I'm not expecting you to finish it. I just want to see how far you got. And then having the students articulate, I only got this far because this was problematic for me, right? I got hung up on this. That gives you some insight into where there might have been um, a barrier or a breakdown in their thinking. And so really kind of, again, bringing it back. So again, that that language is more inclusive. Let's just see how far you got. And some days I might get really far and some days I may not. And that gives you valuable information that you need to help your students. Yeah. And I think that's a nice opportunity for you to then administer Mm self-assessment. So working with children that are able to really self-assess and they can say to you, this is where I struggled in this. And like that then helps you take to take that data to then maybe circle back Mm -hmm. and reteach a concept or, you know, present it in a different way, but being able to, um, have your students complete that self-assessment and give back to you where they feel their standing is, is also helpful. And it says to them, I value what you're saying you need for yourself Mm -hmm. versus me always telling you where you need to grow and improve. Now, let me see if the, um, you know, all of the improvements that I've suggested to you, now they're, you've modeled that right for X amount of time. So now let me see if they're able to look at themselves, self-assess and then give back to me where they say they want to grow. And and that in itself helps to create this positive climate Mm -hmm. in your classroom. And they can really learn how to self-advocate then, which is an amazing skill that we could all use a little bit more of. And so this last one we have here is number five, all students have to write an essay out on paper. And so again, just thinking about the differences of students and like neurodiversity, where their brains might be, um, and just even 21st century living, thinking, working, not everything has to be written anymore, right? Students can, instead of handwriting, maybe perhaps they can type it. Um, there are a lot of great features with technology where they can do um, speech to text and they can perhaps talk out their paper. Um, and that has been really powerful in my own teaching practice um, when I was in the K-12 classroom that I had students ask me, and this was before Google had put out their speech to text feature. A student asked me, they're like, you know, miss, can I talk, can I use my phone and talk out to Siri and Siri writes it for me? And I was like, that's a little interesting, but sure, let's try it. And so I had this student who, you know, oftentimes did not complete his essays that I had assigned and he completed an essay because he just needed to talk it out. And I listened in and I was like, wow, those are really good ideas that I might have missed if I had said no. And so again, honoring different ways of being, doing, and thinking. Students can write it out. They can talk it out. Perhaps they draw it out first, right? And they give you a visual. um, And then they can use that visual as a jumping point for their writing. Or perhaps, and this is again, a practice that I often turn to, was I had students do a PowerPoint first because the PowerPoint inadvertently became the outline for their essay. And they would talk it out. And in talking out their ideas and dialoguing with their peers, they got more ideas for their paper and it made it a lot more seamless to then write it up. Because again, we do have the reality of teaching and that on our standardized assessments, students do have to write. But we can foster and create environments in our classrooms that strengthen their skills in a way that works for them, right? It does not always have to be the test at all times in our classroom. And so instead thinking about how can we use 
you know, all of the tools in our toolbox to help these students become better writers so that when the test does come, it comes a little bit more easily for them. And so these are just some quick examples. I'm sure that there are many more, um, but we would love for you again to reflect and think about these following questions. So what are some practices you want to learn more about in order to create a more inclusive culture at your school? What are some practices you want to implement in your school in the next few weeks, months, or even next school year? And what supports do you need to accomplish number one and number two? So thinking again, that creative, collaborative, Problem solving approach is really what fosters an inclusive mindset. And so who can you turn to, right? Can you turn to your grade level partners? Can you turn to teachers, perhaps a grade ahead or a grade behind you? Can you turn to your administrators, the um, student support teams, right? Child study teams, who can you turn to in your school? Who can you turn to in the wider environment? Who again, again, Jahari and I have referenced a lot on social media. Who are you following out there, right? Who are some blogs that you might be reading? Um, and places that you might be turning to. Um, and so thinking about what are the action steps, big or small, that you can start to take to help you build a more inclusive classroom, being mindful of your language so that all students feel that they are accepted and that they belong. Mm -hmm. And again, as always, if you do need some support, the LRC is always here to help you. So please feel free to reach out with any questions or support needs that you may have. And so that concludes our session. Thank you so much for watching through this. Thank you. Have a great day. Stop recording.